Hebrews chapter 1. We're starting a study of the book of Hebrews today, and we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 1, um, starting with verse 1. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as, more, as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I've begotten you? Or again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, Let all God's angels worship him. Or of the angels, he says, He makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. But of the sun, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You've loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. And you, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will wear out like a garment, like a robe. You will roll them up like a garment. They will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will have no end. And to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? Now this morning, as we look at this passage, it, it seems a bit cryptic. It seems a bit like, hmm, what does he mean by that? There are many um, quotes here from the Old Testament. All the things that, that, that it's saying here are actually pulled right out of the Psalms, out of um, Samuel, out of Deuteronomy. There are things that were said about God, we'd say God the Father. They were things that um, Israel's God, remember, was only Jehovah. They had no concept of Jesus as God, as Jesus coming in the form of man. He was fully human, fully um, a baby, just as, as your children or, or you and I were, but also fully God. And he was fully God from before time. He was fully God in creation, but he had to come um, it, as that baby, he had to come and grow up to be a man in order to be our Savior. God chose to come in that way so that we could have a restored relationship with him. And as we look at the book of Hebrews, we'll see that it's actually almost a sermon in itself. It's, it's meant to show people who had grown up with that Old Testament idea of God, the fear of God, the idea of the Ten Commandments, and you better keep every one of them, the idea of needing to sacrifice in order to have your sins be covered with the blood of a, an animal they had slain. It's showing people that once Jesus came, that old system had been fulfilled which means it was not wrong, it was not in error. The people following it were following God's word. But when Jesus said, I've not come to do away with the law, but to fulfill the law, he was saying, new day, reset. Things are gonna be different now. And the book of Hebrews is really written to people who were steeped in that Old Testament theology to help them as they had started a new life in Christ. Many of them were looking back and thinking, wow, what did I give up? They had the worship in the temple. They had a whole um, culture, a whole system of who they are. They were the nation of Israel. They were God's chosen people. And some of them were kind of getting a bit squeamish about giving all that up and worshiping Jesus. 
Now we might say, why would we have trouble with that today? None of us had grown up in the old Jewish system. We're, we have nothing to be worried about. And the trouble that we find in people still today, this book says in ages past, God spoke through prophets. He spoke, he had even angels come to Moses and bring him that law. He spoke through other ways, but now, today, he speaks through his son. And we often think, well, that was 2,000 years ago. Is that the same today that was when Jesus first came? Is that still today? And we believe, yes, it is, that until Jesus comes back, and we don't know when that will be. Many people are feeling that it's getting closer and closer, but until Jesus comes back, we're still in the same today that the Hebrews um, writer was talking about. So he's saying today, God speaks through son. And I said that funny, that's not how we speak in English. We would say through his son or through the son. But really, in um, the Greek that the book was written in, is, it says, today he speaks through son. And we think that's partly because of the whole unusual character of, of God being um, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. It's not something that's easy for us to understand. Jean chose the songs today on purpose. I don't think we've ever sung that one song before. But she chose them on purpose, maybe not they were your favorite meter or, or style of music, but she chose them to help us remember what it means that God really is fully God, but he sent his son. And that's not quite the same as my son Josh. If I would send my son Josh to do something for me, I would still be here and Josh would be there. But when Jesus came, he didn't give up any of his godness. He was still fully God. And we don't really have a way in our human minds to just make that feel just right. Some people go to great lengths to make little word pictures to help us understand. But there's not really a way we can simplify God down and make that easy to understand. It's kind of a big deal. And, and it's important, it's a very big deal, that Jesus came not just as a man who lived a perfect life and did not sin, but also he came as God. God reaching out to us saying, not mean God and nice son. Some people get that mixed up and think that, looking at Old Testament and thinking, well, that was the God who um, got really mad and, and threw down fire from heaven and killed people and turned them into a pillar of salt and all kinds of bad stuff. So they think Old Testament God is mean and New Testament God is, is nice and loving and kind. Really, it's the same God. It's all one. And as we look in this book of Hebrews, we'll see that many of the things that are written down in Old Testament, very, very true, not taking away from the truth or that it happened that way, but, but also new, made new in Jesus. And that's going to be the point of this book as we look at it. It's important as we do look at it to not um, <clears throat> focus on things like prophets or angels or things that God uses to get a message to us, but to remember that now he comes to us in son and that Jesus, God's son, said, I'm going to go to prepare a place for you. And when I go, I'm going to send the comforter to be with you, the Holy Spirit. He said that I have to go away so I can send the comforter. And the Holy Spirit is not something we see like this gray coat. It's not something we see like a person. The Holy Spirit is something that is God, just as much as God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit comes into us and actually empowers us to live a life unlike the life of 
okay, let's keep track. Have I lied lately? Have I stolen anything? What do I need to kill an animal for and ask God's forgiveness today? It's not like keeping track like that. The Holy Spirit helps us. He gives us the want to. He gives us the ability to want to do things God's way. Without the Holy Spirit, and we'll see that as we go through Hebrews, people were not able to keep the rules. And you and I today are not able to keep the rules. The harder I try to be good, and good means different things to different people, but we all have things in our life we think, I'm going to do better at that. I'm, God, help me do better with that. I know that I'm not pleasing you. The harder that I try to do that in my own strength, it feels like the worst that I do. <laughs> you know, And it could just be that it's brought to my memory that I'm trying really hard to please God. But God does not tell us to try really hard. <clears throat> he actually says, give it up. You're never going to do it in your own strength. He says, give it to me. Let me, through you, let me make you and help you become who I see you can be. So as we look at Hebrews, we see all these Psalms that are quoted, and, it, and it's, it's worth us looking through them a bit. He's talking about comparing Jesus to angels. Now, angels are pretty cool. Like if I've never seen an angel, but people sometimes do see um, beings that later they think, that was an angel that intervened for me. Sometimes they don't see the angel, but they realize, I recently read a story of someone who realized he was stuck in a car in a flood going down, and it was a muddy, mudslide, icky flood, and he could imagine himself getting out through the back window, but he did not have the strength to get out of the car and get through the back window, and he suddenly realized he was standing on the bank of the um, creek that where it was flooding, and he realized in some sense, he was a believer, and he realized that he had had intervention in his life, probably by an angel. Well, angels are really cool things, but Hebrews is telling us, don't focus on angels. It's not about worshiping angels or like having an angel intervene in your life would be the best thing ever. Focus on Christ. And the Hebrews had some trouble with that because they'd had angels come to them as messengers. Remember, an angel came to Mary to tell her when she was going to um, have Jesus. An angel came and told her that. Jesus um, was predicted and shown in the scripture, but an actual angel that she could see came and talked to her. And we've seen many spots in the Bible where where the Jewish people had actually seen or talked to angels. And so they were, remember, not always on board with Jesus as Messiah. So they were kind of getting off into some error where they were really focusing too much on angels. And God in this passage compares and he says, well, to which of the angels did he ever say, you are my son? Well, none. It's like one of those rhetorical questions. The answer is nobody. I didn't ever say that to any of the angels. He says, to, to anyone else did we ever say, and, and, and this is as God speaking, but he says of the Son, God says in verse um, 8, your throne, O God, is forever. So it's God calling God the Son, God, which is, I know, awkward and hard to understand. But it, it's, it's important for us to realize there are people who get this one little thing wrong. They think Jesus, really good teacher, really good guy, aren't we glad that we have his words to look at, but he was not God. If you get that one little part wrong, you have the whole thing messed up because the Bible says that he is the only way to salvation. That unless you get Jesus, unless you get that right, unless you understand that because he died on the cross and rose again for our sins, unless he's the one that you pray to and worship, you have it messed up. You, you really are not um, worshiping God truly. And so it's important. And they go over this on and on and say, yes, Lord, you laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning. 
Well, it's important for us to understand that Jesus didn't start as that baby in Bethlehem, that he was eternal, um, existed before time, existed outside of time, before the universe, and that God actually through Jesus created the universe. So those things are important just so we don't get off track and start really worshiping a false God that we've made up in our head, one that sort of meets our conditions and, and, and makes us feel good. It's important for us to worship Jesus, to understand that Jesus, the Son, is fully God, fully man. <clears throat> And he mentions, to which of the angels has God ever said, sit at my right hand? Now I have a bit of trouble with that. I think, sit at my right hand. Surely, you know, I, I've never been a um, royalty um, fan or anybody. I don't know that much about how it works with kings and stuff. But, but to say you sit at my right hand, God the Father is saying that. He's just saying Jesus is in the place of authority that he occupied before he came to earth as baby Jesus the Son, the Savior of the world. Before that, he was already fully God. He had the authority of God. And after he died and rose again, he returned to his same place of authority. So it's not about sitting in the best seat all the time. It's not like Jesus is just sitting there with nothing to do. It's the idea of saying his authority was the same before and after. What changed about Jesus, and I'm very important for us, is that he could not be the Messiah. That was the word that the Jewish um, scriptures used. The Messiah meant the one who came and took our place so that our sins could be forgiven. The Messiah part is why Jesus needed to be both God and human. Because as Jesus, the human, he felt the same pain that you and I would feel. He felt the same hunger, the same heartbreak, the same unfairness of the world, the same things that face us all the time. He, he as Jesus the Messiah, experienced humanness, and, and that changed God the Son, changed forever. Jesus doesn't give up that Messiah part because he went back at the right hand of the Father, meaning in the same place of authority. He did choose to limit his godliness while he was here. And we often think when we hear those miracles that he performed, we think, well, that's not so much. Yeah, he healed this blind man. He was God, right? But he chose to limit the part of himself. He chose to limit that and not act as God. We believe that when Jesus did miracles, when he actually fed the 5,000 by taking those little loaves and fishes, that he actually did that in the same way that we today, if we relied fully on the Holy Spirit, if we were doing things God's way, that we today, when we pray, are able to access the same power that he did for people's bodies to be healed, for people's lives to be restored, for people to be recovered from addictions to alcohol or drugs or, or lifestyle or whatever it is that is bugging them that they would like God to fix. When people come to God and we pray, that part, that Jesus, the Messiah, says, I'm coming to you as healer. I'm coming to you as restorer. I'm coming to you as the one who brings new life to people who are caught up in old life that they would like to have go away. So it's important, as hard as it is to get our heads around it, and, and as hard as it is to really understand, it's important for us, and Hebrews is going to help us more than just in this introduction, it's going to help us know who Jesus, the Son of God, is and understand that in light of Old Testament. Now, we don't throw out the Old Testament, but we always look at it as enlightened by or shown 
through Jesus. And it really, you'll find, if you can get that concept in your head and pray that, God, show me what these old rules were meaning today, now that Jesus, the Messiah, has come. Show me how it means that the Old Testament is fulfilled in Jesus. A couple of just really obvious examples, many people who say they keep all of the Ten Commandments always um, worship God on Sunday. And the Old Testament commandment says, remember the Sabbath day, the seventh day, and keep it holy. And what we believe about that is that as Jesus was fulfilling those commandments, he fulfilled the Sabbath. The, the Bible calls him Lord of the Sabbath. And that we worship on Sunday, the first day of the week, as Christians, because that's the day Jesus rose from the dead. It does not hurt you to worship on Saturday, but if you have it in your heart that you please God by what you do, by worshiping on the right day that he commanded, the seventh day, and that you have to do that, you are not living in the freedom that Jesus brought to us to fulfill those commandments. So is it wrong to worship on the Sabbath? No, it's not. Many people do both. They keep Saturday, the Sabbath day, as a day that in their own life, they focus on God, they pray, they don't run out to the store or a movie or do things like that. They, they do focus on that. But I'll tell you, not most people that I know don't do both, but you can do that. Is it wrong to um, think that God insists that you worship on the Sabbath? Yes, it is. And why it's wrong is it's taking away that power that Jesus um, gave, that Jesus made happen about fulfilling the Old Testament. It's wrong if you have it in your heart that if I don't worship on the Sabbath, I have sinned, I have hurt God, because you haven't. And really, I would say everybody ought to worship on a day of the week, but even let's say you had a job that you had to work on Sunday. You were a um, nurse or a prison guard or somebody that worked in a job that goes 24 seven all the time. I believe that God can show you, and as you pray, pick another day and worship God. You know, um, I, I don't believe that you're gonna um, not please God as long as you um, worship him sometime with a group of believers. Wednesday, there, there are lots of services around now. So another example of that, um, would be tithing, and, and that's not one of the Ten Commandments, but we have people upset about tithing. Like, is that really still for us today? The Old Testament says, give 10%, and, and actually there were extra offerings and things. And some people think if you don't give a dime out of every dollar that you make, God is never gonna be pleased with you. You're gonna be a mess. You will not have pleased him. Again, the New Testament says, each person should give as God helps him to understand, as he purposes in his heart, so let him give. Not grudgingly, not according to just feeling like, I gotta do it, here you go, God. But out of the Holy Spirit helping you want to give, that's what the New Testament says. Now, I think that 10% is a good place to start. But you work that out with God and, and let him speak to you. God knows what he has blessed you with. So you see, those are just a couple of examples to show you that Jesus did not take away the Old Testament, but by fulfilling it, he's saying, new day, reset, I'm here. I'm here to help you, and I'm going to send you the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, to be with you, to give you the want to, to do it God's way, and to serve God in a way that we could never accomplish on our own. So as we close today, I'd just like you to take a few seconds or minutes, however much you have, and, and think on that and say, so God, what about that first chapter of Hebrews, what about that is important to me today? 
what would you like to speak to my heart today? What is it that you're showing me? And I ask you to do it right now because once you go through the doors, life hits. <laughs> and, and it's easy to just forget every bit. And it's easy to never say to God, so does any of that matter to you today between you and I? Are things okay between you and I, God? Could I just spend a few minutes and say, help me speak to my heart this morning and show me who you want me to be. Show me what you want me to do. Show me who you are, God.